This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this discussion of high efficiency power electronics. Um, this is a very interesting topic, um, partly because high efficiency power electronics appear on both supply and demand sides of the, of the energy equation. So they are both inverters that convert uh, DC from solar power to put it on the grid, and then of course uh, they are at large utility scales within utilities. Um, for working with AC power, and then we go AC to DC uh, in lots and lots of different um, uh, appliances that we have. I mean, I'm holding up here uh, my favorite or least favorite high efficiency power electronics. I spent a lot of time shopping for my um, light and uh, highly engineered computer. I didn't get any choice in this uh, one pound or so transformer. It's kind of the component that time forgot. And uh, that's actually what we're going to be talking about today because there's a huge transformation going on in the, in the uh, field of high efficiency power electronics, um, particularly through new materials. And this panel is going to have a very interesting conversation about that. The, the, what's interesting about this also from the perspective of the, the whole two days discussion is that these components are in a way a case study of the difficulty of dropping transformational um, components into a system that's been designed to be resilient and effectively resistant to change. So there's some interesting sort of promises and pitfalls involved in, in discussing the incredible promise here. Um, I'm going to quickly, I, I know that we're up against lunch, so I'm going to quickly um, introduce the panel and then just let them go. Uh, the first person who will be talking, uh, giving us kind of a broad overview of the field and the research and, and what things might look like over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, if, if everything comes true, is uh, Rajiv Ram. He is a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He's also with MIT. And um, he served on uh, the DARPA Research Council, and he also was a program director with ARPA-E. Um, there's probably... I mean, he's just a fantastic resource to, to kick this whole thing off. Uh, the next person is Hari Hari Kumar, who is the Vice President of Advanced Technology with Ingersoll Rand. He uh, does strategic technology management for a $14 billion company. And uh, the next person is J.B. Straubel, uh, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Tesla Mot Motors. He's also worked on uh, electric airplane propulsion. Um, Super, and uh, with Tesla, he's working on supercharger stations, uh, and apparently as a youth, he outfitted a Porsche 944 with an electric golf cart engine motor. Um, <laughs> anyway, and, um, <laughs> and also we have Umesh Mitra, um, who is a professor at UCSB in electrical and computer engineering. Uh, he's also the CEO and co-founder of Transform, which is a local company that's working on gallium nitride uh, transformers. So with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. All right, thank, thanks, Lisa. So. Um, so now I'm, I'm in back full time at MIT after spending two and a half years at RPE. And so at RPE, one of the things that I was responsible for doing was uh, being the electrical engineer in the house. And one of the questions that I always got asked is why does the Department of Energy really need to be funding power electronics? And that was one of the very first things that I basically tried to address. And so the argument basically has to start from just looking at electric power just in general. Uh, we know that if we take a take a big step back that electrical power, power basically generates a large fraction of the greenhouse gases in the United States. And that's primarily because of our reliance on coal. Uh, if we look forward, we know that the electricity sector is actually growing quite rapidly in terms of compar comparing it 
to the energy consumed in buildings versus the energy consumed in transportation as we see a lot of those other loads basically turn, in, turn towards electricity. Now, one of the things I'd like to do, just since I'm the first speaker in the panel, is actually just take a minute and kind of define power electronics a little bit uh, as, a, as a place to start. So I kind of think of the power electronics as basically being the transmission. It's the thing that fits in between the power source and the load. And so very much like you would have a car, it's really the transmission that goes in between the engine and the rotation of the wheels that gives you traction. And so systems that don't have power electronics that you consume electricity are very much like cars that basically don't have transmissions, right? So basically things that you can always basically only have one gear that you're driving in. So imagine that you, would drive, you drove here to this meeting today only driving in fourth gear. And you can imagine how that would improve, how that would, uh, the impact of that on your fuel efficiency and your drivability if you only had one gear. And it seems kind of far-fetched that if we've got electricity, uh, what kind of electrical systems do we have? What important loads are there that basically don't have electronics in them? And it turns out there's a large number of loads, and I think all of us have a lot of have these loads in our houses today. So if we kind of look at motors without power electronics, uh, these, these are motors that basically only have two states, on or off. They basically work in one in simple ways. So uh, the compressor motor in your air conditioner is an example, right? You guys have all heard of the compressor f go on, the compressor go off as you basically try to maintain a certain temperature. Uh, your refrigerator does the same thing, and these represent some non-trivial loads inside buildings, right? A significant fraction of your building load. Um, this also happens in industry, so process pumps. So there are a lot of, large number of pumps that the way you basically control the, you tie together the spinning of the motor to the movement of the fluid is basically with a gearbox. And so you lose energy and basically all the mechanical friction inside that system. And of course, my favorite example is a louvered fan. So if you're basically trying to dry something, instead of being able to have electronics that can change the rate that you actually spin the motor or the fan, what you do is you basically sp stick a louver on it to basically block the wind. <laughs> And so obviously that's the least efficient way. So the idea of basically electrical systems that effectively don't have a transmission that always are stuck in one gear really is, is reality. It's, it's a transformation that making these systems smarter, introducing power electronics is something that's been happening over the last uh, 10 years. And so what does power electronics do? So we have examples of doing AC to DC conversion, DC to DC conversion in, in, in mobile devices, DC to AC for going from solar power back to the grid, the 60 hertz, and AC to AC for converting the, the rotation, uh, the electricity generated by the generators in a wind turbine to the 60 hertz in a grid. So how do we kind of look, if we look forward a little bit on this technology, um, today about 30% of all electrical power flows through some form of power electronics, and that expectation is that more, more power will basically be flowing through some form of power electronics. Why, why do we expect that? And so we expect that because if we look at various, various sectors, so if we look at uh, electricity, about a third of the electricity in the United States is consumed in residential, a third is consumed in commercial application, business applications, and a third is, for is industrial. So if we look at about 19% of commercial and residential is lighting, and of course we can see that we're going from a world where we've got incandescent light sources that has a filament that plugs directly into the electricity grid to smarter, smarter devices, moving to LEDs where you actually need electronics to convert from AC to DC. Today, you know, the, really you, you basically would be hard pressed to find a power electronic chip that can energy, with en high energy efficiently convert that AC into DC, and about 30 to 50% of the cost of the luminaire today is, on the, is, is the power electronics. If we look at other sectors, so industrial, about 65% of industrial electricity consumption is the pumps and the motors, the fans that are inside that, and they basically represent a significant amount of the energy consumed in the industrial sector, and about 20% of all that energy in the United States is basically lost to some form of mechanical throttling, right? The examples of the gearbox of the louver. And then, of course, we're seeing other sectors where, that are actually becoming electrified. Uh, the best example of that is looking at electric vehicles and hybrid electric vehicles. And if we look today at buying a, a hybrid electric vehicle, about 20% of the material cost is the power electronics. It's the next thing after the battery, typically. So that's the inverter and the charger that's inside here. So you can sort of see why power electronics is actually becoming important. Now, historically, power electronics is in an area that there's been very little investment in the, for commercial applications. Uh, so if we look uh, to the left, that's basically showing you an example of that power brick. It's a typical power density. This is a pretty good power density, 100 watt per cubic inch. And what we're showing on the right is an example of a, the same supply, 20 amps, uh, re research that we funded at RPE, and it's basically resulting in chip scale power supplies. So innovation, because this is a gallium nitride on silicon, silicon technology, 
uh, new magnetic components, uh, new packaging technology, being able to do chip directly on package, and new circuit topologies, these coupled induct couple flux inductor topologies, allow you to basically get to 1,000 watts per cubic inch in a power supply, a dual-phase power supply that's smaller than a quarter. All right, so we're, what we're seeing is basically making that, uh, what Lisa, the power supply that Lisa held up, basically making that invisible and simultaneously making it more energy efficient and easier to produce at large volumes. Another example is, uh, this is, this is uh, another project that we funded at API. It's a five kilowatt inverter, and it's an inverter that's basically about, it's about seven inches across. And we see that in the, in the relatively not too distant future, we can imagine something about the size of a deck of cards that can basically handle about 10 kilowatts of power. And so that basically means you can actually handle all the power processing needs of a large home or small business in the United States with an inverter that's about the size of a deck of cards. This, is, this one's actually about 97% efficient. It's a real device. It uses, again, wide band gap semiconductors and novel, power, novel magnetics to be able to realize that. And then my, my last example is actually being able to go to even higher scale. So this is, this is uh, a year ago, this was the highest voltage transistor that had ever been made. Another example of wide band gap semiconductors in the, on that fingertip is a 15 kilovolt transistor that basically can, can manage on its own about a megawatt of power. And so you can see that you can massively change the, the, the way that we manage the grid if we have electronics that are actually working at grid voltages. And today, these, these transistors are now working at uh, voltages on the order of 18 kilovolts. So what's the impact of, of some of these systems? If we look at this, you know, we could take a one to two megawatts. This is sort of our picture of how, how the grid looks, right? It's a 35 ton uh, of magnetics that are basically working at 60 hertz. There's almost no electronics inside that. If you basically add power electronics to this, uh, you can basically up the switching frequency to 20 kilohertz, all of a sudden your magnetics get smaller. Now your transformer is 450 pounds. You go a little bit faster with, with better topology, new materials, you can basically drop that down to 100 megawatts. So for those of you who are, were at the RPE Innovation Summit in Washington, you saw several examples of systems, megawatt scale systems, that basically fit inside a suitcase. There were two of them that guys basically, the, our researchers basically brought in the back of their cars as demonstrations of real systems that can actually handle megawatt in a modular sense that are on the scale of, watt, of, uh, of rack mounted components. Now, the, of course, there's an advantage. So the other thing that you notice is actually going from the 35 tons to the, 50, the 100 pounds, obviously the system's getting cheaper because you're replacing the cost of copper and steel with higher performance materials, but a lot, much smaller volumes. But the other thing that's happening is the efficiency is increasing. The highest efficient device that I'm actually showing on this graph is actually the 50 kilohertz device. That's got 90, more than 99% conversion efficiency through that, that power electronics component. The other thing is that now, whenever you've got power electronics, wherever you've got electronics embedded in your system, you basically have a chance to be able to couple that with controls, to couple that with algorithms, to be able to make your system smarter. What that means potentially for the electricity grid, if we kind of look out a little further, is that we can actually make it so that instead of a paradigm where all we do in terms of controlling the electricity grid is committing generation resources and dispatching generation resources, now all of a sudden the grid itself can actually become resilient and responsive. You can have a grid where you can actually route electrical power actively. If your transformer not only does it become smaller by the addition of electronics, but it becomes smarter. It becomes a valve or it becomes the equivalent of a router. And so you can imagine being able to make a grid that's more resilient. It's, it's more resilient to fluctuation generation, fluctuating generation, right? From, for example, from renewables, you can actually route power over large geographic areas and basically uh, average out those fluctuations. It becomes resilient to fluctuating demand. And it become, more importantly, it becomes resilient with respect to failure, both hardware failure and cyber failure. And under a program that we had at, our, at Gini, uh, under RPE, this is something that's actually become a reality. There are examples of utilities throughout the United States that actually have demonstration projects to start deploying some of these systems. We have about 40 of these that are basically 40 of these kind of power routers going into active cabling systems in TVA. We have five of these going in at Southern Company. To be, and these are going in for all the advantages that actually come with resiliency. So with that, I'm gonna stop as maybe things that you could do with electronics the, the, all, all illustrating wide band gap, all illustrating new magnetic materials, and what the impact might, might be on the grid as well as on the load. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here, and uh, I really enjoyed the last two days of learning a lot, and I built a lot of new friends as well. So I'm here to share a few things on power electronics and air conditioning and refrigeration. Professor Ram just highlighted how this, this portion of the sector is a little behind in catching up, and we have some areas to catch up with. 
Ingersoll Rand as a company, it's a 14 odd billion listed company. We have multiple brands within Ingersoll Rand. Ingersoll Rand as a brand is in the industrial compressors and, and tools. In fact, that area has progressed pretty well in adoption of some of these power electronic tools as part of industrial processes. Uh, we also have Train, which is an HVAC air conditioning heating refrigeration company in residential and, and commercial applications. And we have Thermo King, which is a transport refrigeration company for moving large trucks and uh, trailers and so on, as well as bus air conditioning. Uh, we have a brand called Club Car, with most of you might be in golf courses. Ironically, you know, with no offense to Tesla, we are one of the world's largest electric vehicle making companies, but they're all on golf courses and they're on deep uh, lead acid batteries waiting for more innovation from people who spoke in previous panels and maybe in this panel on new battery technologies. And then of course we have Schlage, which is a security business, which is really moving very rapidly into electronic transformation. So one common theme across a lot of these brands is the transformation from traditional mechanical company uh, to an electronic and electromechanical and maybe even off on the web kind of company, which is what is happening to security. Uh, you know, largely, and, and as we make this transformation, how does the culture of a company which is traditionally routed in mechanical design systems make that change? And what would be the need from the electronic innovators uh, to kind of adapt in order to move the industry even faster? You know, it's a wordy slide, but I'm just going to highlight a few points. If I look at the mega trends of what's happening and we heard across the last two days, if we look at energy efficiency, which is clearly a focus area, and what implications does that have to HVAC and more specifically into power electronics. So part load efficiency, and Professor highlighted about a compressor going on and off instead of adapting to part loads. And so part load efficiency is clearly an area which is driving and has a lot of implication towards power electronics uh, besides you know, selling life cycle costs. So how do you sell that to a customer to say you're going to pay a little extra now, but you're going to save through its life cycle? It sounds very simple, but it's not very easy, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, we heard a lot about smart grid and demand response, and again, that's an area where electronics can play a huge role. And as we move on to financial you know, situation, in fact, one of the aspects which I've been talking to multiple people even here as I network is the clear lack of, of engagement from banks and financial institutes. You know, I, I live in the city of Charlotte. I talk to Bank of America very often. Of course, there are people who are engaged in the built environment, as we call it, the buildings and homes, but how the financial institutions can you know, get into the whole game of retrofitting for efficiency is an area we I'd rather call on the leaders in this room to kind of take that to a next level. We as we move on to regulations, of course, that's an area which all of us are deeply engaged on through the area of refrigerants. And in fact, a lot of progress has been made in those component technologies to even move to things like carbon dioxide refrigeration, as an example. But from an implication to our industry, life cycle assessment is something which has almost become mandatory in our field. And so life cycle selling, again, back to part loads is a very important part. Getting financial paybacks in areas in fact, uh, you know, there must be people here from uh, Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, did a fantastic work in 2010, I think, on a financial model for building retrofits. And none of the districts in the US adopted it, but guess what, Singapore government is playing on that book by the page. And that's an area we have moved quite a bit in adopting power electronics in areas like Singapore, and clearly maybe areas in US have to catch up. Emerging markets in general, Again, lifestyles are changing. You'll hear more words on, you know, power is not very clean at the same time. Uh, food wastage is a very prevalent thing in places like China and India. So how do you do with minimal power or unclean power and still do a better job on food, uh, food processing? Even adopting technologies on solar and other associated areas is critical. But there are a few challenges as we integrate it. And again, you know, I was talking to some of the LED companies just now in a break. When you talk of lighting, you're closer to an end effect. Whereas when you talk of air conditioning, power electronic is a little backstream. And so the integration is a key challenge, be it in the area of reliability and robustness, uh, be it in the area of lack of standards in areas like uh, air conditioning, and integration development time becomes extremely high. Besides the rapidly changing choices in the motor technology and how these two are very closely interlinked. 
and the whole mindset of transforming from a mechanical design company uh, to an electromechanical and electromechanical and software design company is something all of us will have to do, go through as a cultural change in managing this multiple life cycle of technologies where a compressor might be a 15-year technology, whereas a power electronic might be you know, changing every five years, the rapid space at which we are progressing. And last but not the least, the specification terminology is pretty confusing, at least to a lot of engineers like me, when people use the word like VFD and VHD and inverters and static converters and all kind of stuff, together with the lack of specification in the industry, it actually promotes a lot of chaos. And so I think it's time we kind of get back to basics of what means what uh, in order to improve the adoption of these technologies. So in, in summary, the trends are surely very promising. There are a few challenges which we can surely overcome. And technology, is, you know, there's a clear hunger in the industry for disruption. And I'm sure, you know, the rest of the panelists and people in the room have some solutions for it. Thanks for your attention. And I want to thank uh, Professor Madhav and Mr. Dave, who, you know, educated me in this area to be in front of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is J.B. Straubel, um, CTO at Tesla Motors. And uh, you know, certainly our, our perspective on this is, is transportation related, but uh, you know, power electronics in transportation and surrounding the transportation market actually goes uh, quite a bit uh, upstream as well when you think about chargers and then where that energy comes from. And uh, I think you, you probably, many of you have probably already heard of Tesla, but um, we have uh, several different lines of business internally. Uh, we're building and designing our own vehicles, uh, like the Model S that a customer was kind enough to, to bring to the front of the show today, um, but also building uh, powertrain components, so battery packs, chargers, drive inverters, motors, uh, and selling those to some other companies like Toyota and Daimler. And, you know, I think if it's important to always kind of step back and think, you know, what, what is the real challenge that we're trying to do anyway, and why are, why are we going after this? It's, it's not because we think the world needs more cars, but it's mainly because we think the world needs a different type of sustainable transportation. And transportation is one of the biggest end users of energy out there, and it's also one of the most difficult to migrate towards sustainability. Um, there aren't as many easy pathways uh, to, to move, you know, solar or wind or, or small hydro or pick your favorite renewable um, into the transportation sector. And that, that really is the long-term vision that we have. And you know, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I think solar is one of the best uh, long-term solutions. And, and we try and think in terms of you know, what is a long-term uh, system and whole network look like where you're moving solar directly to transportation? And what are the critical technology challenges to get there? And within Tesla, we, we basically have you know, two areas of, of strategic innovation. You know, there's many other smaller areas, and I'm sure there's a lot of engineers there that'd be frustrated if I, if I boiled it down to these only, only two, but, but these are the most impactful. And uh, energy storage is, is one, um, batteries, everything to do with batteries. And you know, this, this field gets a ton of attention. It gets a lot of research dollars. There's many, many startup companies. It's, it's really, I think, you know, on the verge of being overhyped in some cases. Um, it is, of course, still very strategic for transportation. The second is electric power conversion and control. So generally, that's everything surrounding power electronics. And it touches almost every part of our product in, in not quite so sexy and visible ways as a, as a battery pack does, but uh, the chargers that, that manage all the flow in, into the battery pack, the traction inverter that controls the motor, you know, that's entirely what controls the feel of the car and how it responds when customers push on the accelerator pedal. Um, also, supercharging. You know, this is a big new initiative we're focusing on to do faster DC-based charging, um, you know, as much as 100 to 120 kilowatts off board the car. So that's very power electronics intensive. Um, and finally, with, you know, integrating renewable energy. You know, that, that also is really entirely dependent on power electronics and how it integrates into the vehicle. So you know, these two big areas, and I think power electronics is, is somewhat underappreciated and underserved. Um, you know, speaking kind of from our recruiting side, it's actually much harder for us to find you know, very, very capable engineers and, and new graduates coming into the field that have great power electronics background and expertise. So I, I think it's an extremely exciting time you know, for new students that are you know, in this field already. Uh, there's, there's so many opportunities. And you know, maybe just to look at this a little bit graphically to think about you know, how power electronics plays into all this. You know, the, they're really at the center of all the power conversions that happen uh, in and around the vehicle. 
And you know, especially with renewable energy integrating into that, you know, any time you make this transformation going from AC to DC, power electronics are involved. And in a vehicle setting, particularly any modern electric vehicle, you can't do that in a, in a non-highly controlled way. Um, customers expect their cars to have incredibly you know, fast response. They expect the charging to be smooth and you know, not interfere with anything else that's on their grid or, or in their home. And all of that requires a lot of control and a lot of power electronics. And one reason that the efficiency here is, is so, so very critical, uh, especially for electric vehicles, is because we send the, the energy through power electronics so many times. Um, uh, Professor uh, you know, uh, Rahm mentioned that 30, to 80, 30 going to 80% of the total electricity generated goes through power electronics, but the electricity going into an electric vehicle, especially if it came from a renewable source, you know, might go through elect power electronics as many as three to five times. So you have this sort of three to five time multiplier on that efficiency. You know, 90% efficiency isn't anywhere near, nearly good enough. You know, you've lost you know, almost half of your power if that's the case. And if you look at kind of this flow of, uh, of, of energy here, you know, solar comes in as DC. It has to get uh, inverted you know, so it can go back onto a grid. That's one power electronic stage. Then it you know, either goes to the house or back onto the grid. Eventually it goes through a charger back into the vehicle, um, stored in the battery. Then it goes through a drive inverter to get rec you know, inverted back to AC to control the motor. And if you're driving around in the car and using regenerative braking, you might have a whole other two transformations where the energy comes back you know, through the motor as a generator, back into the battery pack, and then you use it again through the drive inverter. So you know, that, that's a really, really uh, kind of convoluted energy flow, but it's incredibly dependent on efficient power electronics. So these have to be you know, high nines. You, you need to be in the you know, well above 95% to have sort of viable energy flows here that don't just you know, eat up all the efficiencies in trying to have an electric vehicle in the first place. <clears throat> and you know, just to focus on a couple of the, the areas that we look at for improvement, some of the, the most critical R&D areas surrounding power electronics, uh, efficiency is definitely number one. And it's, it's not just because of the, the energy savings, but it compounds into a lot of other uh, areas of improvement. And the second would be uh, controls and software. Uh, power electronics are integrally linked you know, with uh, microprocessors and the software that controls them. You know, a, a transistor that can handle power isn't very useful unless you know exactly what to do with it. And you know, that field is still evolving and, and it's still really very young when you think of you know, all the different you know, ways that could be, power could be controlled more efficiently. And uh, the final really comes down to more materials challenges, you know, pushing to higher operating temperatures, pushing to higher power densities, better reliabilities, lower cost. And those things are really targeted more at the device level, thinking of how do we do better material science and processing um, so that we can have fundamentally better devices uh, that can be married with better control. So that's, uh, that's kind of a quick overview. Um, I also, thinking about this efficiency compounding, you know, this is one that, to me, I, I think isn't very intuitive to people, but efficiency has so many positive feedbacks, especially in a vehicle. And, you know, the first is that you can get higher power density. You know, something that's more efficient generates less heat. So it can actually be physically smaller without overheating. That's, that's a nice benefit if you're trying to package it into a car with limited volume. Um, you can also, of course, get longer range in a car. You know, batteries are really precious and, and expensive, so we want to make the best use of the energy that we store. So if we have a more efficient power converter, using that energy, we can get a little bit more range or have a little bit smaller battery pack. Um, that also can correspond into faster acceleration. You know, if you have a power you know, converter that's more efficient, you end up wasting less of that as heat, and more of it becomes acceleration or, or actual useful motion at the motor. Um, on the temperature side, we also get lower device temperatures if it's more efficient, and that tends to promote higher longevity. So you end up with you know, devices that last longer, um, end up being smaller, and ultimately cost a lot less. It's, it's probably the most virtuous cycle of all the different attributes um, related to power electronics. So I think it's, it's really key when people are, are trying to quantify the, the value or the, the true benefit of increasing efficiency a, a small marginal amount, uh, you need to look at the end application and think of all the sort of positive compounding that can go around that. You know, a tenth of a percent improvement in efficiency in power electronics has a massive improvement for us. That's something you know, we would spend a lot of effort and a lot of money to go after. So um, I won't take up too much more time, but uh, I'll leave some time for, uh, for questions. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, hi, I'm Umesh Mishra. I'm a professor here at UC Santa Barbara and also a CEO of Transform. And um, just, uh, I mean, I'm uh, the last after a beautiful talk, so this will go through quickly because uh, I just wanted to set up a few things. Rajiv has done a fabulous job as is Hari and JB. So anyway, so the heart of all power conversion actually is a switch. And that's how we basically do power conversion. And, you know, the switch allows current to flow when it's on holds off voltage when it's off. Now, I'll take the other tack. Um, actually, manual mechanical switches are very efficient. The switch on the wall is 100% efficient. But as Rajiv mentioned, it's either on or it's off. So if you add intelligence to a switch, you basically switch them on and off rapidly. That's how you add intelligence like you do in a computer or anything else. And when you switch devices on and off very fast, you end up actually having losses or things don't become as efficient as before. Uh, you know, for that, you know, go touch a dimmer switch on the wall, it'll be warmer than a mechanical switch and a dimmer switch has some intelligence. So in my uh, view, gallium nitride based power conversion, obviously I'm the CEO of a company that does gallium nitride, so that's the answer by definition. <laughs> okay. And the answer and, uh, basically is uh, gallium nitride is a material which actually is, um, it's quite a remarkable material. It's the same material that's used in solid state lighting. So it is now uh, a very broad f uh, footprint. And it's low loss when it's on and uh, holds high voltage when it's off and can be switched rapidly. So gallium nitride is basically what we're all about. I won't spend much time on this, but uh, just leave it to, and uh, this is similar to uh, Rajiv's slide, but what it says is that conversion losses basically uses up about 10% of all the electrical energy that is generated in the country today. And that's enormous, right? And that's equal to all the energy that is generated by renewables today. So it's like pissing away all the, you know, the good energy that you have in just converting it to a useful form of energy, which is, we'll all agree, is not kind of a good thing to do. And so as, um, we uh, deal with this problem, I think, uh, I think there'll be multiple benefits, as uh, JB mentioned. Uh, I'm saying transform code. This is a uh, slide I just uh, snuck in. So any, anybody who does this well could reduce uh, total energy demand by over 10%, uh, which is $80 billion in annual energy cost these losses uh, have uh, to our economy, and uh, 600 terawatt hours of energy is saved, which is 500 uh, coal power plants equivalent. So this is, imagine just having five coal, 500 coal-powered power plants just turned on to supply losses, okay? It doesn't do anything, it just supplies losses. Pretty nasty stuff. So what is a terawatt hour, actually? And you know, if you look at all these terawatt hours, they're in many, many segments, similar to what everybody said, uh, industrial motor drives, um, you know, and that, could inc that includes, by the way, the air conditioning and refrigeration aspect, that's huge. Uh, data server power supplies, this is growing like crazy, um, <clears throat> both, uh, both uh, to do search and stuff like Google does, uh, like what or Oracle does, but also Facebook and uh, social media, they all use uh, massive server farms. Um, solar inverters, I, I agree uh, with JB, I think solar is a very cool technology, and solar inverters uh, actually play a critical role in the uh, the full system cost, uh, significant roles now that panel costs are dropping so dramatically. Uh, and electric uh, motor inverters, uh, this is growing very, very fast. It's a small number now, but it'll become a large number in the future. So what are all these terawatt hours actually? And um, this is just a tongue in cheek slide, but uh, what it's, you know, it defines what a terawatt hour is in a way that we can understand. San Francisco actually consumes six terawatt hours of energy. New York City does 50. Vegas consumes 33 terawatt hours of energy. The whole um, United States, the Western United States consumes 270 terawatt hours of energy. This is half the total energy we lose in power conversion. So you can imagine what the scope of this problem is. It's not sexy at all because it's hidden, as has been mentioned by Hari and others. It's a hidden thing. It's at the back, but it, it's what makes uh, we have to tackle it because it's, uh, it's so important to, uh, for basically uh, all aspects of um, the end result is multiple uh, climate change issues, 
just um, size of the unit issues as Lisa talked about in the beginning. But anyway, let's get to the brass tacks. Here, you know, you can have a great idea, and how do you actually shove it into the market? Okay, it's, that's very hard. I, I'm telling you from personal experience, it's very hard. Okay. And what you need is investment first to make the technology market ready. So we have money at Transform from venture capitalists and uh, from ARPA-E, from the Office of Naval Research and uh, from the Innovation Corporation of Japan, which is a Japanese sovereign fund. The most important thing that you have to do is you have to actually provide the performance at an acceptable system cost. That means you really, a return on investment argument works with an industrial customer, does not work with a consumer very well at all. So basically, if you make something happen in this, you better have the system cost be actually at par with a silicon-based solution or preferably lower cost. So. And as uh, was alluded, the increased technology cost, because gallium nitride or silicon carbide or any other technology is more expensive than silicon, by definition it is. But it is defrayed by reducing the commodity cost, so less copper, less aluminum. It also is very important that the less you're dependent on copper and, and aluminum, the better uh, handle you have on your pricing structure. I mean, if China's economy starts heating up, the cost of copper and aluminum just goes skyrocketing, and you can't change the price of your PV inverter. So your earnings are going to be dependent on macroeconomic conditions, and you don't have control over that. And so you, the less you're dependent on it, the better off you are. And the market needs to be ready. Oh, the, making it easy to use is very important. I mean, you don't need, you cannot make a customer study any, you can't do give homework, you know to a customer. You basically have to make it just plug and play for the customer. It's real easy to use, important. And, la and lastly, the market needs to be ready. In these very conservative markets, and they're rightly so conservative, I mean, for many reasons, safety being an important aspect, you need one person to actually change, and then a domino effect uh, follows. So this is basically the market that we are playing in. And just a few things. Uh, if you go up in frequency, um, Rajiv I mentioned this, if you go up in fre frequency, everything gets smaller because all electrical parts uh, scale uh, inversely with frequency, higher the frequency, smaller the, the part. And you see on the left a conventional, what is an inverter with a filter, and on the right you see an integrated filter. And uh, uh, this basically was funded by RPAE, and that's a module with an integrated filter operating at 300 kilohertz. Now here's the product that came out of uh, a lot of the work that we've talked about. This is the first gallium nitride-based inverter product, which is now going to be released in um, late 2013 this year into the market. And what you see is a 40% uh, volume reduction relative to a silicon inverter, and the efficiency has gone up by over 2%. Uh, it's at 98.2%. This is a solar inverter. This is the full inverter, not just the power electronics. This is DC in to AC out. And now that's remarkable. And what it allows you to do is make a very small solar inverter, which is fan-free. Because, again, as JB mentioned, if you are highly efficient, you don't dissipate heat. If you don't dissipate heat, you don't need a fan. So what you see is a small, fan-free four and a half kilowatt inverter that will be entering the market. Very excited about it. Also, what uh, these power electronics do and does is that with these integrated filters, you get a pure sine wave that comes out of the power inverter as opposed to that jagged wave you see um, on the top, which is a conventional uh, power electronics with uh, uh, signal coming out of a silicon-based inverter. These smooth, these smooth signals make motors more efficient. They actually impact the efficiency of the motor because motors like smooth signals, not jagged signals. Um, this, is, uh, the, uh, this is Lisa's uh, slide, actually, effectively. You want to make adapters smaller and ultimately disappear. And I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, data servers are a huge growing, um, data server farms are increasing rapidly, and efficiency savings in data server farms uh, you know, is basically a bottom line advantage to companies that own data server farms. And for each 1% efficiency in 
improvement in a typical data center. You save about $2 million in electricity cost per center. So that's another big advantage. Well, thank you for listening, and happy to take questions later. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. So you're, it's this highly uh, fluid sort of area that you're, you're moving in in your, in your area, but then you're dropping it into big things like refrigerators that have to be able to run 24 hours a day for 10 years without hiccuping. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, um, and, and cars are sort of another, another level of, of safety and, and performance. Um, and I wonder if Hari and JB could kind of talk about, you know, if, if someone came to you with a perfect, a perfect box that's gonna give you an increase of two or 3% efficiency in a transformer, what's gonna keep you from throwing it right right in, and, and how long a, a, an adaptation time are we talking about? I thought I might start. Sure. I think it's a, you know, a very important point that you know, no technology stands in isolation. It's about how it plays with the rest of the players. And one of the areas, as I was talking about, this mechanical to electronic transformation, is there's a lot of firmware and software and a lot of aspects which go in between connecting the logic of what is happening downstream to what are you trying to do upstream with the power. And that, with the lack of standards, which the way some of our earlier colleagues spoke about with the Ethernet of things, the lack of standards, that interconnect and that code development is not been as fast as one should, you know, one thinks. And, but the positive side I feel is as we have not done a great job with the technologies which are kind of commoditized to date, uh, the, the barrier to jump the gun as as new materials come up is actually going to be lesser. And that's a good thing, provided mm -hmm. we figure out a way of working integrated across these subsystems in a better way. And JB? Well, um, I mean, if there was truly something that was 2% or on that order, it's, it's a huge you know, value. You know, we, we would work really, really hard to, to adopt that as fast as we could. And I think we kind of pride ourselves on trying to be the, the industry leader in, in rapid adoption of new technologies. <coughs> Um, that said, I, I think often what gets overlooked, and, and we are approached, I'm sure everyone's approached often by kind of new startups with new technology, you know, the, the whole uh, production and, and quality control all the way through the manufacturer at scale uh, is a pretty big challenge with, with power electronics, uh, maybe less so with magnetic mater magnetics materials, but certainly with uh, switches. And uh, I think, you know, having people that can demonstrate, you know, how to partner or operate at, at really high volumes uh, of production with very, very high quality is critical for us. You know, we can't sort of get started and sort of adopt, you know, 25% of our products and have some problem and scale back, then wait and scale up. You know, that gets to be a pretty big uh, uh, hurdle mm -hmm. that has to be overcome. Um, so. And I, I think you mentioned at one point that the, the testing on the Volt, to, it took four years to introduce new components. So that actual, the, even though possibly the Tesla is the closest thing to a computer that looks like a car, um, you know, it takes a long time. You know, you're still working with sort of automotive scale. Yeah, I, I think four years is, a, is maybe too long. You know, that, that's pretty conservative. You mm -hmm. know, in a, in a it's a whole presidential space. term. Yeah. yeah. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> in, well, in a technology space where things are improving, you know, so quickly, you know, if, if you're forced to use technology that's four years old, you're, you're inherently out of date. And that's, a, I think, a tough challenge for a lot of these incumbent industries when they find themselves in a space where technology is improving quickly. Uh, it's hard to be relevant and, and you know, up to date and still be as conservative as they are used to being. So you know, we have to find ways to accelerate that testing. And many of the parameters can get tested pretty quickly. Um, you can you know, do clever ways of, of you know, figuring out what life will be under different aggressive operating conditions. So that's where the innovation comes, is how do you, you know, figure out a 10-year life in one year of, of validation? Yeah. But if you, want, I mean, if you want to get into Ford's supply chain, right, to, to provide them the inverter, the next inverter for their generation of cars, I and mean, that's, a, that's a long period, I mean, that's a long, period, I mean, that's a long uh, qualification procedure. It's a long design cycle to basically enter. I mean, it's a different industry, it's a different kind of company, right? It's got a different design cycle. It's got a different scale that they're looking for. And so, you know, I think I think it varies dramatically from industry to industry, but I know I know that those are like getting into the big 3, getting into the large product lines for the big 3. I mean just looking at their design, looking at the wins that our company has basically had to had to get <laughs> in order to be able to be designed in was not those are long time scales, like seven year time scales. <laughs> I, I, think the, I think the challenge is that, you know, automotive companies um, the tip to Big three or, or other, you know, European automotive companies are used to, to working on a time scale that's so much longer. 
and they're not used to working with power electronics or software or motors or batteries at all for that matter. And you know, it, they're, they're sort of coming into it now and, and you know, getting programs going at scale, but the supply chain is still the same supply chain that buys plastic bits and metal stampings <laughs> and seats and tires and brakes. And you know, those things don't innovate very quickly. You can afford to have a four-year qualification time frame for a new brake component supplier because it won't be that different four years from now versus what you bought four years ago. <laughs> but with power electronics, I think, especially, and batteries as well, you know, they, they, they've got to find a way to, to speed that up with technology relevant things. I think I was trying to comment on this coexistence of multiple technology life cycles. And I think that's going to be reality. And in our earlier work we did on security products, where you have so much of electronics getting onto your home lock, the lock may not be changed for 10 years, but maybe you might upgrade the electronics. Mm -hmm. And someone asked a question yesterday on design for sustainability. And that might be something we may have to kind of embrace as to how do you co-design multiple life cycles that even through the development, you, you are ready for new technologies. And I don't think we have a ready solution, but we got to question our design practices in that regard. Mm -hmm. And if I just may add one thing, uh, the, uh, and to put a positive spin on this, I think, I mean, Tesla is obviously, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that leader, that, you know, that the, pers the, in, the industry leader that can cause a domino effect. And that's, that I was referring to, but, Luckily, in power electronics, there are other markets which are very fast to adopt. And they are like gaming, mm -hmm. right? I mean, X, you know, doing PC gaming, Xbox, all this kind of stuff requires efficient power conversion. And they are all about hot new stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can sell. So the, you know, you've got to find markets which, where there's less resistance while you build on relationships and enter markets where there's more relation, uh, more business. I, I think this is such an interesting case of what happens when you come, when you bring something out of the lab and into the marketplace, and all of a sudden you have to think like a gamer, think like an HVAC guy, and I mean the the span between those two industries is so enormous um, that it's it's really interesting. Um, I want to uh, get to audience questions in just a second. Uh, one of the things that's co been coming up again and again through this conference is how do we sort of keep the efficiency and uh, gains and the jobs themselves in the US? And uh, uh, there's a lot of different ways of looking at that. I mean, obviously, we're, the more of these power electronics that are rooted in the US, we are saving that energy. But how does this, how does the job uh, situation shake out, or is it, do you have thoughts on that? And, and I bring this up in a way because we, we have been talking about solar and batteries. Um, batteries in particular, they, they thrive in countries that have a, a strong subsidy program. And so it's been hard to, uh, there, there's a political component to some of the, to the, the um, building of some of these uh, technologies in, in the country. So maybe you can, somebody can go with that. I can, I can jump in. Uh, I mean, at Tesla, we do build all of our power electronics in the US. It, it was um, not maybe the obvious choice in the beginning, but I think as long as you're trying to do fast innovation on the same product cycle um, and innovation into the manufacturing you know, process as well, that really you know, benefits you being close to, to your final product assembly and your customers um, and, and where your engineers actually are. So I think that's probably the key is, you know, trying to make sure that we stay focused on the innovation more so than, than just uh, reducing labor content. Um, you know, labor content in power electronics is not a big driver in most mm -hmm. cases. Um, you know, even especially in the newer materials, you know, it, it's even less really pure materials content. It's more, you know, sort of highly processed materials or software development. Those kind of things, you know, are, are natural job creators right here. So I think, you know, biasing products to really have more focus there is, is the key. And, and essentially, you're, you're embedding kind of service industry um, software within the electronics. In a way, you're, you're creating a different sort of product than, than pure manufacturing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really, I guess, focusing more on the innovation and development. And um, you know, th those are, in a lot of cases, I think, you know, the, the really valuable jobs. And it's really what creates uh, relevancy and, and keeps the product improving. Uh, <laughs> You know, that if you focus, you know, more development into better software, uh, that tends to increase efficiency a little bit higher, and it tends to, um, you know, certainly have a product that can be more competitive. So. All right. Other thoughts? I mean, so, I mean, 
And so at RPE, we had an interesting perspective on this because by um, our, our mandate was to basically support the U.S. economy and to support the jobs. And so one of the requirements that we had, it was actually embedded in all of the contracts, is all the manufacturing for all of the power electronics across the, you know, the several dozen programs that we supported all had to be done in the United States. And so all of those companies transform, create, and all of those companies basically manufacture in the U.S. Those are all U.S. jobs. I guess the thing that I would stress is that, you know, there are a lot of drivers to basically making it so that that continues to happen. So one of those drivers is the lead that the U.S. has, for example, in materials like silicon carbide. I mean, we have just an incredible lead. So even though you might buy a silicon carbide transistor made in Japan, the substrate was almost definitely made in the United States. So, I mean, that, that lead is so, is so phenomenally large that it's, it's actually a strength that we can leverage on with the investment that we've been talking about in, in wide band gap. I think the other things that, you know, the currency fluctuations are non-trivial. I mean, if you look at Toyota, I mean, the investment that we made in API for their uh, high power density inverter, that was basically matched by Toyota North America. And the reason for that is they wanted a supply chain that was local mm -hmm. to be able to serve their market. They couldn't tolerate the currency fluctuations. It was really kill it was killing them. And so, you know, we're actually starting to see that their higher end vehicles, like the Lexus is basically moving to the US for manufacture, that the higher end electronics is gonna basically moving, be moving here. So I think there's a couple of places, a couple of ways you can sort of see that things are gonna happen locally in this area. Um, I agree, uh, and actually to uh, take off on Hari's point as well, you know, when you, the, the, the system innovators have to actually get all the subsystems talking to each other to basically get resonance between technology cycles and some other cycles within the system. So I think that what's, what happens is that it, it becomes natural to actually keep the supply chain, the full supply chain, basically local rather than this, um, the, the economics of the past mm -hmm. in other materials. It, it might still work in other systems, but in, in this system, it's you got to really understand all the way from the material to the final packaged part, and then have the cycle of learning be implemented and have it implemented in the correct place. I mean, if I buy something from company X and buy something else and then ship it to company Y and then bring it to company Z and if, if the final product screws up, where is the problem? And you can't even solve it. So it's really important to have that full supply chain. So I'm very optimistic of this particular industry having a very large US presence. Interesting. I think it's... Uh, one of the things to work on further is the availability of talent pipeline. Yeah. Because clearly, as people alluded earlier, this is not as sexy. <laughs> and I think if the energy is the future and how we can have more trained power electronic engineers in our pipeline in the country is extremely critical.